Your Holiness, Mr. Loeb has covered a lot of territory. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he talked about is that for the free enterprise system to create blessings for the most people, we require government regimes that protect the property rights of individuals. I know you travel all over the world. You talk to people in oppressed countries and in free countries. What do you think that our nations can do more to protect the property rights of individuals so that our systems can bring more poor people out of poverty? So your presentation, which it seems, I think, as you mentioned, was quite I guess, more holistic. Comprehensive. No? Comprehensive. Wonderful. Uh, I think, basically, uh, things are interconnected, interrelated. Interdependent. No? Interdependent. Uh, so if things something independent, uh, then we only are concerned about that. Uh, usually we call expert, only that thing. Uh, but the reality, everything is interrelated. Uh, so the proper way is to pursue that. Uh, you see, we have to sort of look more holistic. From a larger picture. A uh, larger picture. Mm. So now here, the firstly, I think, individual initiative. That also entirely depends on their self-confidence. Uh, self-confidence also sometimes blind way, yeah, over self-confidence. That is dangerous. So education. Education also is a more holistic education. Right. Uh, 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 then, as you mentioned, I think the whole system, I think here, the judiciary system, the rule of law, very, very important. In any way, uh, among people, uh, some little bit of, sort of the strange people or wicked people, but, uh, 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 so the protection from law. Uh, so all this, I think the combination of Mongoose should be the So you can see many factors that uh, are really intertwined. Uh, uh, then, uh, as is both, I think, mentioned, the trust. Uh, even in the business field, uh, ultimately, trust important. So trust very much in order to develop trust, trust honest, truthful, transparent, very, very important. So in this, uh, in, in that respect, I think the more self-centered attitude, uh, then uh, some sort of, uh, uh, the quite, sort of the, the always possible to develop uh, differences or gap appearances in reality, <laughs> saying something nice, <laughs> uh, but thinking something different, uh, then immediately destroy trust. trust. So honest, transparent. So long you really take care about others' well-being, then no room to cheat, because you take care about their, so their well-being. Well so here, ultimately, see, all these things are depend on the rest of the community or rest of the sort of the, sort of the group. So therefore, trust, very, very essential. Trust, first, you see, you remain a strange person and hoping more trust from others is <laughs> illogical. <laughs> first, we must sort of show sincerity, honest, truthful. So this uh, cannot be produced by machine or drug, <laughs> but through, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the human nature, affection, mm -hmm. uh, sense of human brotherhood, sisterhood. Uh, biologically, 
potential is there. Now, through education, further nurture the, you see, these qualities. Quality. Mm. That I really believe, you see, exist, as I mentioned yesterday, the existing modern education is something lacking in that respect. So we usually, when we uh, sort of, uh, when, when the point about love, compassion, these things, uh, we always just rely on the religious faith. Uh, some people, I think yesterday I mentioned that it's some people feel moral ethics must be based on religious faith. Then it becomes very kind of, uh, no. limited. No. Like that. So after all, I think the human, uh, for human being, for humanity, see, we really need uh, more kind of, uh, universal, uh, universal. A un sense of universal responsibility and commitment. So wonderful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, after to sort of listen uh, yesterday and also today, particularly today, I develop more respect about capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Otherwise, this is my impression: capitalism only take the money, then exploitation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but we've learned from your holiness over the past two days that free enterprise truly can be and should be a blessing in the lives of all people, especially the poor, but every single one of us in this room. Notwithstanding that fact, it will not be if it's not on the basis, if it's not executed and practiced on the basis of brotherhood, of compassion, and of moral living. And that's, of course, what we're learning from you these last few days. <laughs> So our respect for capitalism was very solid coming in, but our respect for the underlying principles that can make it live up to its promise, of course, are coming from you. <laughs> we move on now to Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt is a professor of ethical leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business. He's also the world's leading expert on the science of morality and has given these ideas from a moral dimension a great deal of thought. John Haidt. Well, thank you, Arthur, and thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, this is such a wonderful day when a religious leader, a revered religious leader, who is particularly beloved on the left, comes to a free market think tank run by a man who seems every day to be arguing, your most recent argument was that conservatives should start fighting for social justice. Before that, it was declare peace on the safety net. Um, so this is scrambling all the categories. This makes me so excited that we might finally break out of the rut we've been in for so many years in our arguments about the role of business uh, and, uh, and government. <clears throat> um, in my remarks today, I'd like to tell you uh, three stories about capitalism. <clears throat> um, His Holiness, well, His Holiness em embraced the first story until, I guess, about five minutes ago. I just discovered maybe he's moving on to the second story, which was told by uh, Glenn and Dan. Um, <clears throat> and what I'd like to urge uh, is that he then uh, devote his efforts to helping us write the third story. So here they are. <clears throat> the first story uh, is that capitalism is exploitation, and it goes like this. Uh, Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops. Craftsmen made goods. People traded these goods locally, and that trade strengthened local communities. But then one day, capitalism was invented, and darkness spread across the land. The capitalists developed ingenious techniques for wringing more work and wealth out of the workers. They then sucked up all the surplus wealth for themselves. They used this wealth to buy political power, making the rest of us their pawns forever. The end. <laughs> now, in the wonderful uh, recent book, Why Nations Fail, Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson um, show that there's actually a great deal of truth to this story in most nations and at most times. Um, economic institutions have generally been extractive, not inclusive and generative. Uh, this exploitation story activates many of our uh, uh, deep moral psychological circuits. One of those is that we judge people based on their intentions. And if people do something for us without intending to help us, we don't tend to give them much credit. Uh, this is certainly what happens to business people who enrich our lives 
uh, but are we grateful? Well, as Adam Smith put it, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, uh, the butcher, the, let's, what's happening here? Uh, let's see, let's be grateful for better technical equipment. Okay, it seems to be steady now, all right. Um, uh, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, uh, but from their regard to their own interest. We may praise their skills, but we never praise their virtue. Uh, in fact, we see them as selfish. And this, I believe, is the view that His Holiness held, again, until five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> I first met His Holiness at the University of Southern California three years ago, um, and at that time, at that uh, conference, I asked him, what kind of government would you like to see in Tibet if you could advise on a new government for Tibet? What would it be? And his response was this, uh, quote, between socialism and capitalism, I'm a socialist. And furthermore, I always describe myself as a Marxist, but not a Leninist. Um, in my mind, Marxism is the only economic theory that expresses a sense of concern about equal distribution, and that is a moral thing. Whereas capitalism is about how to make a profit, only that. And in order to get more profit, there is no hesitation to exploit. But what if we were to judge people and ideologies not by their intentions, but by their effects? Well, that would take us to the second story, which was told so ably by, by Glenn and by Dan. I can therefore abbreviate it. Uh, it. It might go like this. Once upon a time, and for thousands of years, almost everybody was poor, and most people were serfs or slaves. Then one day, some good institutions were invented in Britain and Holland, and uh, um, these democratic institutions put checks on the exploitative power of the elites, which led to the creation of economic institutions that supported private property rights, risk-taking, and innovation. Free market capitalism was born, and it spread across Europe and to many of the English colonies. In just a few centuries, poverty disappeared from these fortunate countries, not only that, but people got dignity and safety and longevity. Free market capitalism in this story is our savior and Marxism is the devil. In the last 30 years, dozens of countries have embraced our savior and kicked out the devil. And if we can spread the gospel to the rest of the world, we will soon enter a golden age. The end. All right. So, um, that, of course, was told much more ably and with much more detail by the, the two previous speakers, but I think it's important to note that these are sets of ideas that have been circulating through the intellectual class and through, through political discourse for centuries now. Um, let's see, free markets really are miracles. I've come to see this as I, I joined uh, the Stern School of Business just a couple of years ago, and suddenly I'm seeing how miraculous it is that you really can turn water into wine, vast quantities of wine at low, low prices, as long as the vineyard owners can get access to cheap credit and transportation networks and have property rights, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it really accomplishes miracles. Um, but because free markets are so astonishingly good, people sometimes come to worship them. One of the basic principles of moral psychology is that morality binds and blinds. What this means is that when people come together around a shared worship of some sacred object, it makes them cohesive, it makes them able to work together, but it blinds them to the faults and flaws, it blinds them to nuance and subtlety. Um, Pope Francis pointed this out in his uh, controversial exhortation last November when he said, quote, uh, he was criticizing those who embraced the second story. He said, quote, a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. And this brings us to the third story about capitalism, uh, which is a story that isn't written yet, but it's one that we'll be writing in the 21st century. It begins like this. In the 1990s, or once upon a time in the 1990s, capitalism triumphed over all other forms of economic organization, and the entire planet began moving towards prosperity. Uh, but we didn't live happily ever after. In fact, this period marked the beginning of a new chapter where we discovered a bunch of problems that we didn't really see before or didn't appreciate before. 
<clears throat> uh, the gap between rich and poor within nations began to shoot up. Economic gains went mostly to the rich, who began increasingly to use their wealth to buy legislators and laws, just as was charged by the first story. The problem of global warming was first recognized. <clears throat> Um, and just as Asia was beginning to industrialize, making it so much harder to solve and leading to apocalyptic forecasts of submerged cities all around the world. Um, the crash of 2008 shook our confidence in capitalism's ability to regulate itself without strong government oversight. And as market values expanded beyond the marketplace into medicine and education and family life, many people began to feel somehow cheapened as though something, something valuable had been lost. So this is our challenge for the 21st century. We celebrate the fact that more than a billion people have been lifted out of poverty in recent decades by free markets. Yet we know we can do better, as both of the prior speakers pointed out. If we can strip away the anger, the worship, and the ideology, we can look more clearly and openly at capitalism and its ethical challenges. And I take it that's what our panel today is really about. We can see that the supply chains that keep our shelves stocked originate in the dangerous sweatshops of Bangladesh. We can measure the polluted air and the empty oceans that we're bequeathing to our children. <clears throat> And we can have a more nuanced view of equality of opportunity, particularly here in America, where wealth buys your children a much, much better starting line in the race of life. So let us be grateful to the butcher, the brewer, and the baker, even when they are corporations. Let us look back in awe at the political, accomplish the political and economic changes uh, that brought us from the first story to the second story, at least in, in many of the uh, most advanced nations economically. And then let us work together to write this third story, a story that must draw on insights from the political left and right, and that must draw on insights from secular thinkers and religious leaders alike. Is there a story about capitalism that could be embraced by Pope Francis, by His Holiness, and by the rest of this panel. Let's find out. Thank you. Thank you, John. Your Holiness, Dr. Haidt has told us stories about the capitalist system that are at odds, and that they're common. All three are common in America today, and, his, and around the world, for that matter. And his conclusion is that the capitalist system can be the greatest blessing economically in the history of mankind, but that it has certain dangers. And these dangers come from ignoring, once again, as we've talked about again and again today, those who are being left behind. Now, we understand that in theory, but to understand in practice those who are more vulnerable than we are, those who are weaker, such that when we, each of us examines our conscience tonight before we go to sleep, we can say, did everything I did today help those who are weaker than me? Such that we can answer that question in the affirmative. What practical advice do you give us for helping the poor to enjoy the blessings of the free enterprise system that every person in this room is enjoying today? Uh. Uh, I don't know, uh, I am Buddhist, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as my daily sort of day, practice for five hours, some meditation. The meditation means here, analytical meditation, analyze, analyze, uh, analyze the ultimate nature of oneself, and also the nature of phenomena, nature of the whole world, whole universe, all these things. Uh, but that's because of the, uh, something typical about the Buddhist sort of the practice. So not much, not relevant. relevant. So, uh, then uh, the, these sort of complicated sort of philosophical views, you see, they finally uh, see, 
since the things are heavily interdependent, interdependent, interdependent. therefore, you see, the, for your own interest, you see, you have to take seriously about others' well-being. Uh, you see, taking care more about others is not selfishness. The uh, best thing for your future is taking care about others. Basically, we are social animals. One individual's future depends on the community. Uh, community now, modern time, the community's future depends on the nation. The individual nation's future depends on humanity. So, you see, use sort of our intelligence, the reality, then uh, the not blind, sort of selfish way. But, see, usually, I, the, since many years, I usually call, you see, uh, we are selfish. It's very important for our own survival. Without, without self-care, well, we cannot survive. So, therefore, uh, but that is selfish. It should be wise selfish rather than foolish selfish. So many problems. We just think of oneself and don't care about others' well-being. Ultimately, you will suffer. Taking care more about others, then you get more benefit. So that's the, I think, old majority tradition, you see, talking that. The same message, message of love, compassion. And for, because of different these practices, message of tolerance, message of forgiveness. And also, you see, in order to sort of the, sustain the sort of go too much sort of the extreme selfish uh, and, or sort of now the greed, too much greed, also you see they go extend. So therefore, practice of contentment. All major religious traditions, you see, talk that. Uh, now we, these, I think not just, you see, because of the religion, because of the culture of some mysterious things. Simply, our deepest life, our this very life, comfortable life, peaceful life, these are very much related. Relevant. So now we need, I think, the religious field, you see, in order to promote these practice, we are using some mysterious sort of things about next life or about sort of uh, heaven, these things. Uh, yes. Now we must find a way. Don't talk these things, but this very life, very world here. Uh, I think everybody is what more peaceful, more happier, more friendly world. I, everybody, you see, agree that, isn't it? Yes. Nobody, I think, ponders to nuclear weapon or war. Oh, even you see, seeing you see with the television, or bleeding, killing, dying. Our response. Different. Now, for example, I think response, one, one cup of, sort of blood or a cup of milk. I think my nature, the milk, blood, like that. It's basically our nature. Uh, so, you, so, therefore, you see, these, these things, uh, you see, we, everybody, you see, loves peaceful life. Friendly life, friendly to community. Right. Uh, and we very much sort of appreciate trust. Someone trust you, you feel happy. And that also automatically develops some kind of response, responsible right. to, to help them because they trust me. This is our nature. Not come from religious faith, not talking about next life, not talking about heaven. Or hell, <laughs> out of fear of hell. That that is not very good. <laughs> Through reasoning, thinking more about positive, then develop enthusiasm. Out of fear, some enthusiasm, not very good. <laughs> so, so in any way, so in any way, I think we can teach, we can educate people for 
best way to fulfillment of self-interest is taking care of the rest of the humanity. I think modern education, uh, I think modern day, I think education is so important. Now, through education, I think we can because of the, bring these uh, we can, uh, bring these ideas. Uh, uh, we, we can promote the conviction about these values. It take time, ten years, twenty years. Uh, so that's my view. Whether realistic or not, you should judge. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot more in store for you, but I want to sum up in four points what we've learned from His Holiness this morning. And then I want to take a moment for some gratitude. The four points that we've learned from His Holiness on the basis of the wisdom that we've gotten from our colleagues here and his reactions are number one, each one of us notwithstanding the differences that we have, including each one of us who's not even here today, those who are rich and poor in other countries around the world, each of us is one in seven billion. And understanding our common humanity is the basis on which we can spread the blessings of all the things that we do. The second lesson that we learned today is that the free enterprise system that we came here to discuss is itself a blessing, but it has to be predicated on moral living from each one of us. The third is that moral living is a practice, and it's a practice of compassion and a sense of shared humanity. The fourth lesson is really the good news that we've gotten here today, which is that the principles and practices of global brotherhood and global sisterhood are in each one of our hands to practice and to teach, which is an affirming lesson and something that we can go away from from this important session today in each one of our lines of work in everything that we do to make a better world. This is our charge, our, our privilege, this is our obligation in a very joyful sense. This brings us back to the subject of happiness, 